Good day once again. It's interesting to note we are halfway through our course. This is lecture number 24. And amazing how time flies by. We've covered almost half the course and we've covered what capital markets are, what securities are, how they are traded, what the market mechanics are, what is the difference between preferred and common stock. We've talked about funds, we've talked about fundamental analysis and technical analysis, we've talked about the um, theories like the dividend discount model, we've talked about efficient market hypothesis, we've talked about random walks. In fact, last time we did talk about random walks. And we came to know that prices of stocks do not move randomly, although information flow is random. Information keeps coming in, in bits and pieces, but stock markets prices do not move randomly. It's the news that comes in randomly. The movement of the stock market prices is consistent and systematic. They do not move randomly. So this is what we learned in the last lecture about the random walk idea. We also talked about the efficient markets and the different forms of efficient markets and then what the consequences were of the efficient market. We learned that there were quick price adjustments because of the information flow coming up and we came to know that prices react quicker than the information is coming in and that prices reflect all informations internally and is then visible to the public. Although new information is independent, it is incorporated into the prices reflected in the movements. These price changes make effect on the way the market is moving, whether positively or negatively. Efficient markets have their own role in the market's movements. And then we must understand the different forms of efficient markets. The consistency with which the market is running, the length of time in which it takes to show up the movements of the prices reflecting the news, and that we must understand that these economically efficient markets reflect the commodities prices or the stock prices in the share prices. And in this case, the transactions costs do not matter. In the efficient market hypothesis, we also looked at the fact that there were different forms of these hypotheses. So we saw, and you can recollect what we saw last time or we heard last time, it was that there were three forms of efficient markets. We saw that sometimes technical analysis was of no value. We also saw maybe why should people focus on fundamental analysis, whether there was any intrinsic value, whether it was not valuable in the semi-strong form. So we looked at different forms of the efficient market, like the strong form, the semi-strong form, and the weak form. And then we notice why should investors worry about the markets, whether they were efficient or inefficient, as long as there was a chance of making money in the market. Why were we were talking about the averages, the results, the movements of the prices, we looked at the transaction costs, we looked at the buying and holding capacity, we also looked at whether there was any matter that could be resolved by the professional money manager. We looked that there was less time spent on individual securities and they preferred passive investments. Passive investments, we remember, we talked about passive investments as in buying and holding on to the scripts. Or then if you were doing it individually, you must have special insight into the capital market. So if the markets are internationally efficient, we must also look at the tax burdens. We must also try to control the transaction costs and achieve 
and maintain the desired result. Also, we must understand that it is good to diversify and maintain a diversified portfolio to avoid risk. Except that there were different market efficiencies in different markets, we understood that there was some anomalies in the market's behavior. And there were exceptions that appeared why the market was reacting in such a way. There are people who are surprised whether the market should react to, to man-made chaos or natural disasters, whether they were reacting to anything that was creating chaos in the market. But earning announcements also affected stock prices like external factors, man-made or natural disasters. So we saw the stock market had the ability to absorb all the stock prices and the news is that were coming. We noticed the anomalies that low PE stock ratios, low PE ratios belong to stocks tend to outperform stocks with higher PE ratios. But we did talk that higher PE ratios show the confidence of the investors in these stocks, but then low PE ratios sometimes outperform them. So then, should portfolios be based on price earning ratios? This could result in an undiversified portfolio if you have all the portfolios being based on price earning ratios. Now, price earning ratio is nothing very mysterious. This is public information available to everybody and every investor because this is published and then. We understand that whatever is available to everybody, this becomes public information. Sometimes a size effect also takes place in which smaller firms tend to behave in a different way than market capitalized larger firms. Sometimes there is a significant effect or tendency for small firm stocks at the end of any financial year, like in the month of January we might find that the results are being affected on the small stock companies. And we notice that one third of the effect came in immediately after the financial year closed, like July or in January, because we have financial closes in December and June. So you saw effects happening in post financial year closed months. And we noticed there was a lot of anomaly in that. We also noticed that when we looked at the ranking systems, there were anomalies. And then we had a ranking system like one being the best and five being the worst. And we saw that prices stuck to those numericals being issued to these companies. And these companies tended to react to the, uh, the star rating being given to them. Also, we noticed that research letters, advisory letters, and investment letters tended to reflect on the prices of the stocks. And sometimes transaction costs also offset returns. These were the things that created anomalies in the market. In these anomalies, we have support for market efficiency that is persuasive. We understand that much research is used for different methods. We also understand these anomalies that cannot be explained satisfactorily, but markets very efficient, but not totally. They are efficient, but not completely efficient. So for an individual to outperform the market, fundamental analysis beyond the normal must be done. Since we are going to put in time for individual stocks, and have greater insight into the stock, we have to have the superior ability to outperform the market. And that we can do with a blend of fundamental and technical analysis. So if we consider that the markets are operated efficiently, you may think that some investors with the skill to detect a divergence or an anomaly between price and semi-strong value can earn a greater number of profits. This excludes a majority of investors 
and anomalies offer opportunities as well. So there is a controversy about the degree of market efficiency, and this shall remain. Obviously, majority of investors are not superior in thinking about the in-depth intricacies of the market. Therefore, a lot of people will not be able to use this anomaly as an opportunity to make money. Ye sari baatein toh humne bhaar bhaar ki hain. Humne baatein jab kaar lini thi market efficiency ke random walk ideas ki, toh humne financial research mein do aspects ko touch kiya tha. Behavioral finance is something that we didn't touch. Behavioral finance tells you about the nature of people investing in the capital market. The psychology, the mentality, the thought process of individuals and how their mind is working while they're investing money into the stock market. How does their mind act? How does body language reflect their sentiments? Whether they are looking at the market with a pessimism or with an optimism. So these ideas are reflected into behavioral finance and this can be looked at with maybe casualness or with serious insight on how the body and mind coordinates in making decisions in capital markets. This also gives us the idea whether established behavior changes or established behavior tends to follow established mind patterns of the individual investor. We have seen that people tend to follow other investors who they think are better performers. We have also noticed that people have a tendency not to lead or take initiative, but to follow other established investors. If a market is going bullish, we'll find people gathering behind the same sentiment and thinking that the market is bullish. Whether it is or it isn't becomes secondary. It is the herd mentality that takes over. It is the immediate situational impact of the market's crowd, the market makers, that overlook all the facts and figures that should have been taken uh, into account in the first place. Our behavior is also a function of how a problem is framed. Our behavior shows this. And the reference point we use in evaluating a situation. This is how we look at the market and through our minds. We may have definite preferences for one alternative over another. That according to classical finance is economically equivalent. But there are instances where you have made a confirmed, educated decision of investing in a particular stock. And when you do decide to invest in that, you get carried away with the sentiment of the people around you. This is typical. It is not confined to our local environment. This is universal. So you shouldn't be upset if there's something wrong here. A typical investor is a typical investor in our region, in our country, and internationally. They behave in the same way. We have noticed also that whatever is being looked at as herd mentality or to focus on behavioral finance, we see same attitudes in other markets. It's not that this is only confined to our local markets. This sentiments prevail everywhere. Everywhere that I have seen during my excursions, I have seen the typical mindset of investors. Generally speaking, we notice that people get carried away with sentiment and their established behavior patterns. One is loss aversion. This is an established behavior. They do not consider loss to be a part of business. 
We only look at the positivities and never look at the negativities. Jabke business may profit or loss dono hi ho sakte hain. They fail to understand the aspect of loss. And it is shocking for them. Ki unhe loss ho gaya. And this is very childish. You must be understandable to the process of business where you can get profit and maybe loss as well. Or fir usse bad ke kya hota hai? Regret. Pashtana. Ek loss aur uske upar regret ke mene aisa kyun kiya? So jab hum baat investments ki karte hain to humne hamesha ye kaha hai look before you leap, think before you leap, think you, before you make a decision and then don't regret that decision. Do your homework first. But we become so myopic towards loss, we become so myopic towards the market that we have this fear of regret and loss aversion inside us. And then we look at to find solace in finding like-minded people. And then we herd ourselves together with them. Okay. They don't want to be confronting gainers when they're losers. They'll hate the fact. So they hurt themselves and then this misery continues. The regret, the fear, the myopic vision and then hurting with all the losers is how you behave. And then you stick yourself to that and then you anchor yourself to that loss and get that problem in built into you and then you can't get rid of that loss giving share. So what do you do? You have an illusion of control of the market, but actually you're making a fool of yourself. You do not control the market. It is the illusion that you know the market, that you know the company, that you know the industry, and then you can understand that this is all elusive, hallucinational effect. And then you think there'll be a prospect of earning money. You think that you will outperform the market, and you think if you go on to the buy and hold strategy, you can hold on to it endlessly for profit. So what do you do? You look at different aspects. You look at the established behaviors and how they react. You will understand that you'll maybe do mental accounting. profit ho you keep doing your mental accounting. Yeah, aap asset segregation karenge. Asset segregation karenge ke achha, mere paas ye jo profit hai, isko main yahin rehne deta hoon, loss wale share ko main samhalta hoon, uski averaging karta hoon, taake hume nuksaan zyada na ho. Asset segregation karke aur zyada aap compound karte hoon. Ya phir aap apne aap ko guilt feeling ho gaya, aap hindsight mein, you'll have a bias decision overconfidence. In the end, I shall prevail. That whatever has been done by you has been built on hindsight and because it is actually a product of overconfidence and then you'll start framing you'll blame other people. Success has many fathers, but failure has none. You'll attribute all the successes to your hindsight, your confidence, your uh, spirit of understanding the market. And if there's loss, you'll say, I was told by such and such XYZ person to buy such and share. Nahi to mujhe pata tha hindsight mein, to mujhe loss hoga. You are being illusionary, you know, deviating from the truth because now you have made biased expectations. You understood that these expectations might one day give you better results. Reference dependence. You will be depending on hope. You refer to hope. You think maybe if I don't sell, it means I won't make a loss. So you will stick on to your original illusion of true decision by sticking on to the stock that you bought with your overconfidence and with all the mental accounting that you've done. 
So these are actually established behaviors that we have within ourselves. And we also may interpret all these statistics, especially by misjudging the likelihood of event. Might be wrong interpretation on our part. We couldn't figure out everything in our mental accounting and figure out things wrongly. Misinterpreting the facts. Miscalculating. Confusing our mind thoughts because of hindsight bias. We didn't consider things. Certain random numbers seem less random than others. And this belief influences certain investment decisions we might take. Randomness being lesser than the other randomness. Information flow and its interpretation. Statistical information inflow and its misinterpretation. Getting wrong with our qualitative and quantitative analysis. Getting wrong with interpretations of quantitative and qualitative data. Reading the charts wrong. Misinterpreting price chart patterns. Reading the figures wrong on the balance sheet. Misinterpreting a one-time window dressed earning per share. Fabricated balance sheets and then sticking onto them instead of referring them to the notes and looking at really what was the profit really like and why is it being depicted here in such a phenomenal way without realizing that was perhaps a one-time gain. So sometime misinterpretation can really make the difference between a loss and a profit. The figures, mental accounting, your hindsight bias, your ability to be overconfident about the market and saying that you know the market more than the rest, thinking that you're superior or that, that you could control the market are things that we have looked at into behavior finance. In behavioral finance, herd mentality takes effect immediately. Sometimes it's egos. You have inflated egos sometimes. Sometimes you want to buy 5,000 shares of a particular stock and you look at people buying maybe 25,000 stocks or 50,000 stocks or 100,000 stocks and you have this egotistical feeling and then you buy more than you can manage. So sometimes these mistaken statistics, especially the nature of round numbers, the psychological blockage, extrapolation, the difference and misinterpretation and confusion between percentages and numbers, the apparent order in which there has been an information inflow, regression to the mean, sample size, these are all mistaken statistics that you could make a confusing decision with. Round numbers. Round numbers tend to focus more into your, register more into your mind. Digits, decimal points are sometimes confusing. Percentages are also confusing at times. Percentages, like in yields, dividend yields, or dividends can both be confusing. So maybe if you have been given a 50% dividend announcement, would necessarily not mean it's a 50% dividend yield. A 50% dividend would be a 5 rupee payout on a 10 rupee share. But a 50% dividend would again mean 5 rupee payout on a 80 rupee price stock. But then dividends would be different. Percentages sometimes confuse you with numbers. Decimals and comma marks can be misinterpreted as well. Sometimes quick, abrupt decision can be 
hamper in your profit making plan. This hampering effect can perhaps also be very long lasting. Statistical mistake, technical chart interpretation make, or buying decision mistakes can be rectified. What we all do is we make a fool of ourselves by sticking on to our decisions and then not getting rid of the shares that you wrongly bought in the first place. In behavioral finance, we can refer to this to as getting married to the shares. You get married to the shares, you can't get rid of the shares, even if they're a loss giving share. You don't have that sort of courage. You don't have that sort of a confidence that you made a wrong decision. Okay, I need to stop this and get rid of the shares. What we do is we stick around, we cling around to hope. We look for hope and perhaps that then takes a very long time. People tend to react differently when confronted with losses rather than gains. Gains is okay, that's win-win situation, laughter time, but it's the loss that really scares you and then everybody tends to react differently when confronted with losses. That's where we try to find out the difference between men and boys. It's the loss, it's the loss that shows what you're built of. It shows whether it was just an inflated ego or you have the ability to, you know, absorb the loss. And that is the difference between eventual winners and eventual losers. So there is a tendency to become less risk averse or even risk seeking when adverse event occurs. You're thinking otherwise. The market is reacting contrary to your thought process, and then there is tendency to become less risk averse, or even to risk seeking when an adverse event occurs. So investors may choose to gamble on an even bigger loss in the hope that the loss will disappear. How will it disappear? This is no magic. Losses don't evaporate in thin air. That's still there. It's the illusionary effect that you have that you will think that the loss will disappear. It won't. Even stains on your shirt doesn't, don't disappear just like that, unless you make amends. Losses will be there. It's just you're looking at them. Well, it is a loss, and yes, it isn't, but you are being illusionary of the fact. So what do we do? We try to create more complex situations by gambling and speculating in a way or trying to find a way to get out of the situation. What one normally does is, when we're talking about shares, we water the weeds and pluck the flowers. We keep holding on to shares that are giving you a loss and we sell shares the moment they give you a profit. So we are watering the weeds and plucking the flowers, which means we're doing the wrong thing. We should actually be watering the flowers and plucking out the weeds. Get rid of shares that are giving you a loss and then hold on to stocks that are giving you a profit. We tend to take profit very quickly. We tend to take losses for a long period of time. So this is what we must understand when we're doing this. But then how do you gauge all this? How do we look at the market? And where is the market going? Then we have to look at indicators that tell us how the market is performing. Your balance sheet, your personal portfolio assessment will tell you whether you're making a loss or a profit. How do you look at the market for a benchmark where the market is 
and how is it performing? Is it performing well or is it performing weakly? So we look at indicators. We look at indicators that tell us what the market is doing. So we look at indicators that provide a composite report of a market on any given day. We can look at indicators of the market behavior. These indicators are named differently. Internationally, the most renowned indicator would be the DJIA indicator, which is the short form for the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicator. This is a benchmark for the market to be shown whether the market is going up or down. And what is this? This is a composition of 30 of the best stocks in the USA, 30 of the best blue chip stocks inside the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the market follows these leaders. So the DJIA index is referred to very frequently, whether the DJIA is up or down, and then you'll know the rest of those. So these are price-weighted indices. These price-weighted indices have the tendency to focus on the movements of these 30 stocks. Essentially, these are added into the index composite. The prices of 30 stocks divided by 30 gives you a fair index value. Then they obviously they're from time to time adjusted for stock splits and stock dividends, but this is the oldest, best, most well-known, universally recognized measure of how a market is behaving. This indicator would then be called an index. So the DJIA index is the internationally recognized, universally accepted benchmark of market behavior. And once again, it's composed of 30 of the blue chip stocks. The best stocks are included into the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Another one these days that you might have heard about is the Standard & Poor Composite Index, also called the S&P 500. S&P 500 would then mean 500 companies inside the indicator or inside the stock. These is compositions of 500 large stocks or large companies into the stock index indicator. So these two, the DJIA 30 and the S&P 500 are the benchmark for stock market performance behavior study. And these are expressed in numbers relative to a base index, let's say 10. Within the period of 1941 and 1943, the base figure was 10 and is being built up on this now. The DJI and I strongly recommend you, I strongly recommend you to look at your TV screens frequently, more frequently, and look at all the international news is coming in from international news agencies, and then you look at Standard & Poor's and DJIA and S&P's and Nikkei and DAX and Sensex and KC100. These indices will become more familiar to you. In valuated indices, prices and shares outstanding are considered. You can have a number of ways you can make an indicator or an index. It all depends on how you want to look at the market. But this Standard and Poor indicates how much the average equity value of the 500 firms in the index has increased relative to the base period or relative to the preceding day or relative to the preceding week. You are able to look at the relative strength of the index. Obviously, when you're measuring something, there has to be a benchmark. In this case, like I said, it's 10. To be able to look at how high it's gone from the figure 10. But that is not important. What is important is that we must look at how it has behaved from the preceding day or the preceding week or the preceding month. And then we know currently how the market is behaving in the near term. So we must understand that these equity market indicators let you know how the performance of the market is being. You are able to look at these now. We also have other indicators. We would look at 
indicators like Nasdaq. Nasdaq would also give you a composite indicator. The New York Stock Exchange would also give you an indicator. Number of indicators that you could look at and you would be able to understand how the markets behave when we are looking at the indicators. These indicators are value weighted market indices. Then there are other international indicators as well, like the Nikkei 225 average index of the Japanese stock market or the Tokyo stock. In the Nikkei 225 index, we have average weighted companies of Nikkei 225 average. These would then be looked at the companies, the top market capitalist companies being traded at the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Then we have the FTSE, the Financial Times Stock Exchange indices of the London Stock Exchange. Then we have DAX in the German Stock Exchange. We have the CSC in the French Stock Exchange. We have so many indices that we can benchmark them to look at it, our own internal index as well. These indices can be used to look at the industries indices and the company individual companies' values. Because there is no other way to evaluate the strength of the market. The index or the stock market behavior is also called the barometer of the economy of the country's health. These are benchmarks. You look at benchmarks for evaluation. You look at benchmarks for equating the performance of the company. These benchmarks are put in place so that you know whether stock markets are behaving nicely or not. We must also look at the fact that these indices can be misleading. But how can that be? It can. Because if you're looking at, let's say, the DJIA, it's focused on 30 stocks. If you look at the S&P 500, it's focused on the 500 stocks. If you're looking at the Nikkei 225, it's focused on the 225 actively traded stocks on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. But then what about the rest of the stocks in the market? The market also has other stocks. So we must look at all these things. That your particular share might not be included in the index, and that could be misleading for you. So indices are useful in assessing the performance of investment. These indices are absolutely important for you to be able to assess the performance of an investment. But then, what index do you choose to look at? There are a number of indices, I told you. There are a number of ways that you can make indices. So it is important to ensure that the chosen index is an accurate proxy for what investors want to measure. Matlab, if you're looking at a stock market index to evaluate your investment in bonds, this doesn't make any sense. Or vice versa, if you're looking at your performance in stocks, looking at the index of a futures market or bond market will not help you. It will confuse you because indices have different variations. So, a equity index portfolio index or a stock index indicator should not be used with a bond portfolio indicator. There's two different things. That's a fixed income stock is not. Bonds are fixed income and stocks are variable income. So, the index cannot be the same. So, an index of a large capitalized stock should not be used to judge a small capitalized stock portfolio. If you're looking at blue chip stocks, can't get the picture right if you're looking at your portfolio that's based on small cap stocks. They will not go in line with the index. So what I want to tell you is maybe your portfolio built up on small stocks can actually outperform the index. Yes, it can. Obviously, since the index is based on large capitalized stocks, your portfolio is based on small capitalized stocks, and we looked at the random walk ideas and the efficient market hypothesis, where small capitalized stocks could outperform large capitalized stocks. There's just a possibility that these indices may not be replicating the performance of uh, 
portfolio that you built up, which does not include even a single stock from the index. So never ever confuse indices with your stock. Your stocks may not be included in the index. Your stock may be very small. It's difficult to understand the stock indices in relationship to your own portfolios. So there are an individual investor can choose from any number of indices. Any number of indices, like equity indices. I just mentioned you had the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500, you, or you have the S&P Mini or the E-Mini. And I just took in the names of a number of regional indices and a number of uh, indices based on other countries. But it is up to you how you choose an index to gauge your performance. These indices can give you a generic macro information about where the market is going but it cannot be an accurate depiction of the valuation and performance of your portfolio. But having said that, you can not do without indices. You cannot do without market indicators. You have to have a benchmark. You have to have an indicator in which you can relate your performance or at least, if even it's not about your individual performance, you can look at the generics, you look at the generalized market behavior. On any given day, you will be able to. The first thing I told you was markets do not remain static, they have a natural ability to move up and down, which means they will never ever be in the same place. It's going to be a rarity that the stock index indicator will be the same one day and the same the next day as well. That can only happen if, the in, if there is a curve on the exchange and there has been no activity in the market. Then you can have an indicator which will give you the same reading as yesterday. But as long as the market is running, as long as the market is vibrant, whether it's weak or strong, it will move in any direction that it is destined to. But you cannot, you cannot have a market without an indicator. You cannot have a market without an index. You have to have indices. You have to have these indicators that will be able to tell you how a market is performing. I'm not talking about just stock markets. I'm not talking about just equity markets. I'm also talking about maybe bond markets. I'm talking about markets with fixed income. I'm talking about markets in the futures market. I'm talking about markets of the options or the derivatives market. The markets must have indices. It would be naive to think that how would you evaluate the performance of the market if a particular share has gone up and a particular share has gone down, how will you evaluate? So you must understand how indices are constructed. What are the ingredients of the construction in an index? Whether it's going to be price weighted, whether it's going to be equally weighted, whether it's going to be constructed on capitalization, whether it's going to be capitalized on being the best stocks, being moving with volumes. You can look at a number of ways how you can construct an index. Volume-based indices will tell you about companies that are best traded companies in the index. In price weighting, you can assign heavy weight to high price stocks. And then you can make use of a divisor to just for stock splits. So you could have a price weighted index in which you would give maximum weightage to stocks, which are higher price, and least weightage to stocks with lesser weightage. Assuming that you're constructing a price-weighted stock, we could look at the stocks in a way in which you would understand that if you have a 100 rupee stock or a 500 rupee stock and a 10 rupee stock and a 20 rupee stock, you would then give them, you would perhaps add them up and divide by the number of stocks you want to base your indicator on. 
assuming it's based on a 50 index, then we would have 50 companies in the index. Even if they were top price weighted, the top expensive companies based on market price, you would then put in the numbers of the companies, XYZ, ABC, JKL company, you put on the price of the company, and then you add up the total and divide by the divisor of 50, and then you'll have an, a value, an average value. When you have a base value, you'll be able to know next day prices of the stocks in the index would vary from the base figure. So the index would probably go up or probably go down the next day and the next day and the next day onward. And you would be able to assess how the market is behaving in relevance to the day the index was formed with a base figure, whatever it is determined. If you were to look at indices based on volumes, you would look at volumes being significant or being less significant. Or if you would look at capitalization weighting, you would look at the size of the company, the market capitalization of the company. And then there would be no need for adjustment for stocks. Based. But obviously, you must adjust it for changes in index components or primary stock offerings or share repurchase programs. Since we're talking about a market capitalized companies offering, we'd be looking at market capitalized changes happening. Obviously, they're issuing more shares. They're issuing more capitalization will change the, uh, the total market capitalization value of the, of the index. So when we are doing a um, uh, study on the market capitalization, we would look at how we are going to evaluate the index, whether it's volume based, whether it's capitalized based, or whether it's price weighted. These are just a few indices that I have just told you about. Now if you look at our local environment, I told you we have three stock exchanges the Karachi Stock Exchange, the Lahore Stock Exchange, and the Islamabad Stock Exchange. And each one of those has a separate index. Islamabad has an ISE 10 index. The Lahore Stock Exchange has an LSE 25 index. And the more recognizable is the KSC 100 index of the Karachi Stock Exchange. If you look at these indices, they're all different. The Lahore Stock Exchange 25 index composes of 25 companies which are the most traded. So this would be a volume-based index. And I'll appreciate if you visit the website of the Lord Stock Exchange and have a look at the index. If you look at the Karachi Stock Exchange Index, we'd be looking at an index based on 100 companies. Now, how has that been constructed? We have 34 sectors in the Karachi Stock Exchange, ranging from mutual funds, going down to banks and textiles and cements and vegetable oil and glass and ceramics, mechanics, cars, auto parts, and miscellaneous. And we have 34 sectors. And then we look at these 34 sectors having the companies with the largest market capitalization. So we have one representative of these 34 companies as market representative of the sectors. So you will have one company each from the sector, and that would mean 34 companies in the 100 index. And then we would have 66 other companies, which we will take from all the sectors based on market capitalization, and then add them up and look at the performances at the KSC 100 index. So 34 market leaders, each from one sector, and then 66 companies based on market capitalized. This should form the index, the KSC 100 index. Like I said, you'll have fixed stock index, you'll have variable index, you'll have international index. There are a number of indices that you can look at. But if we were to look at, we must look at our regional 
area. You must look at the indices of our neighboring countries to have a feel of the region. Indices internationally may be helpful, but it's going to be the indices near to our country that are going to be more helpful because it's going to give us the local climate and the local environment in the region, in the subcontinent. And more specifically, it would be a good idea to look at the KSC 100 index, the LSC 25 index, and the Islamabad structure in ISC 10 index. So next time when we talk about indices, you'll remember when you look at the TVs, you'll understand what indices are. Thank you.